Well, hello and welcome to our online Bible study. This is our third in lesson in Second Peter. And we're going to remind you a little bit anyway of where we've been, what we've been talking about in the first uh, two lessons. Um, in that we talked about the first one, introducing you kind of to our outline. And we use the word creator, talking about the author. Um, of course, that is Peter himself the servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Then uh, in our previous lesson, we looked at the culture. Um, how, what was their life like? What was their environment in which they lived? Talking about the world. Uh, we're also going to learn a lot about the uh, culture in the next level, which is talking about the characters. We try to pick out different people um, in the book. And then... Sometimes you'll find that the same people are mentioned over and over again, but what he's doing is he's giving them a different descriptive term. You'll see what I mean when we get into that, but it's a great way to look at uh, the Bible and study it out for yourself. Um, as you begin to dig into it, you learn about what is common among all Christians. These things are said about Christians in general. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that just yet, but we talked about the creator, Peter, the culture, the environment, the characters, different individuals. Primarily, we're going to look at the negative and the positive, the good and the bad, if you will. And then in a future lesson, uh, a week uh, that we put this other one, or of course, depends on when you may be able to go right into it, we'll look at the contents. And uh, how long we spend in that, I'm not real sure. But as we look at this, again, we're going to focus on the characters. Take the first verse again as we do. Simon Peter, a servant. So we're going to see right off the bat, there's Peter. But who's the other characters? In this verse, matter of fact, you can find four. Uh, Excuse me for using a character or even a person to give reference to God or even to Jesus Christ. It's my way of identifying an individual, uh, be it God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Um, that's my classification as I'm studying. But we begin to learn a little bit about them. Simon Peter, a servant. We already looked at him quite a bit and trying to figure out um, some things about him, and we're not trying to do an autobiography or a theology on God or a Christology on who Christ is, but to introduce these particular people. Now, again, we've already talked about Peter, but then as we begin to look at the individuals, we'll have several names first off, right off the bat, of what he calls this group of people that he's writing to. He calls them the beloved. He calls them the scattered the called, the chosen, the brethren, and citizens. Well, he doesn't use that term directly, but he talks about them being part of the kingdom. You can't be part of the kingdom if you're not a citizen. And then he notes by name certain people also. He notes Noah, not by name, but the fact that they are Noah's family, the eight persons in the ark, so Noah's family. Then we find Lot. Uh, we find the holy prophets, not named except this in this general way, and all the apostles, as well as God and Jesus Christ our Lord. So if you wanted to spend a time organizing, finding out, and studying all of those, uh, that would be a, a great benefit. We're just, like I said, going to focus on uh, the left side of your screen, the beloved scattered to call the chosen the brethren and citizens. And really, even on that, we're going to have to be brief in talking about that. So I'm going to give you that first word, the beloved, from that's used in 2 Peter 3 and verse 1, where he says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. It says a lot to me to, to use the word that he does, beloved, agapetos, because that's a form of what we have, or I should say the root word is agape. And that word is used several times in the book, uh, the beloved, that he is writing to. He cares for them. There's some relationship 
and a pastoral uh, feeling towards them. And I think it comes from his encounter with Jesus when Jesus looked at Peter and said, Peter, do you love me more than these? Uh, you know I, I love you, Lord. He says, then do what? Feed my sheep. Do you love me, Peter? You know I do, Lord. Then feed my sheep. Actually, the first time is feed my lambs, then feed my sheep. And feed my sheep. I think these are the sheep that Peter was called to feed and to care for. I, I, Peter's now acting the part of the under-shepherd, and he is displaying his love for the Lord Jesus Christ in his very actions of caring for these scattered sheep. He also talks about, again, going back to the very first verse and the way that he characterizes them. He says, to them that have obtained, well, they didn't work for it. They got it the same way I did. Look at the story about Cornelius and the way that Peter talks about him. Look, he got the Holy Spirit. He got the gift the same way that we did. It was all by grace. So here he's writing to them that have obtained like the same kind of precious faith with us, just like us. That word obtained from the Greek gives you a word picture of by lot, adds that in there. It is, in other words, the same precious faith that we have obtained by lot. God chose it. That's what that is. That's the gift of faith by grace. By grace we are saved. We, we know that we are the scattered, or he talks about them being the scattered, the run out of town ones, but he also talks about them as being brethren or his family. And again, is that beloved? There is family. That's who you love. Those who have been saved through the righteousness of God, our Savior, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us, how through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That includes the idea of being the called, the elect, and why we're supposed to make our calling and election sure. He's talking about those who have experienced the providential and personal work of God in them, which also we know from verses 10 and 11, that's why he talks about, wherefore, the brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so, listen to that, for so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's why we use the word citizens. Now, we should from that also be able to see that they were a people that were totally dedicated to the Lord. They, he, they have made Jesus for them. I'm not that they have made him because God made him king, both Lord and Christ. But they are making him the king of their life. They recognize him as prophet, as priest and king. Peter isn't, doesn't use the word, but he is implying that they have a belief and that they are committed for the rest of their lives, for all of eternity, and they are making the New Testament, the principles of the old, they're making the Bible their only rule of faith and practice. They are ordering their lives according to their master, Jesus Christ, and they have no problems claiming him as Lord, as master. Going back again to that verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith, again, with us through the righteousness of God our Savior and our Savior Jesus Christ. Well, you know, I, I don't even have time to get into the Apostle Paul as noted as one of those who also wrote to them and taught them. Peter calls him our beloved brother Paul. And, of course, we already made mention that he mentions uh, God and Lot and Noah, the eight souls, the prophets, the apostles, our own Savior. And I'll comment on those when we get into the content. But I do want to show you these last couple of verses here um, in this portion, anyway, of the lesson. 
where he talks about in verses 3 and 4. Notice this. According as his divine power hath given unto us, so he's including himself and them, but he's given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given to us. So we see that a couple different times here. Something's been given to us, but he has given to us exceeding great and precious promises. And that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So when you're studying this, we could say that Peter is also describing them in terms such as, for instance, sanctified, as according as his divine power hath given unto us all things. We've been set apart by the Holy Spirit. He has gifted us life, and he has gifted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto glory and virtue. We have been sanctified. We are being sanctified, and one day we will be totally sanctified. Then he says we are not only sanctified, but we are recipients. Again, he has given us this by according as his divine power hath given us all things, and whereby are given unto us. Right below that, look at the word recipients, and below it you see whereby are given unto us what? great and exceeding exceeding great and precious promises. We could also use the word not only recipients, but partakers. Um, that by these ye might be partakers or associates of the divine nature. He doesn't make us gods. We don't become little gods. He's talking about how that now we have been made a new creation, a new crea- creature. We've been set apart from the world. We have received part of his divine nature that gives us life and makes us his children. And we could go even further than that, like he does in this verse, and say that these people are blessed. They are blessed because they've been made partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In other words, we're no longer bound. We're no longer slaves to the lust of the flesh. We've been given a new life. He didn't just transplant and he isn't just reforming the old life. That old life's going to the grave, but he's given us a new life. He's activated, if you will, a creative fiat in changing us. We're blessed because the power of our old corrupt nature has been broken. We have been made new creatures. But now, let's look at, because otherwise we're going to run out of time, um, look at these negatives, the negative characters. And of course, one that ought to stand out right away is Balaam. You have Balaam, false prophets, false teachers, fallen angels, the ungodly, the unjust, the wicked. And then you have the scoffers, the spots, the blemishes, and we even have types, or again, descriptive terms using animals to describe these negative people. And he uses the terms brute beast, a dog, and a pig. And we'll get to those briefly. What he's doing, he's writing about certain men, and he is describing them as those who distort the truth, destroy the faith, and they are successful. They have followers. He also calls them unlearned and unstable who twist or rest the scriptures, and he refers to them as the wicked who have fallen. The scattered saints live in a world that is already hostile. We talk about how that Rome has run them out of their own homes. And now... We not only have a problem of living in a world that has enemies on the outside, but we find out there are religious enemies from the inside. There are some bad people who are involved in local church affairs. That's why, again, for us, pay attention to what's going on. What does it say in 2 Peter 2 and 2? He says, many 
shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. I, I'm not going to try to give a commentary on every verse, but just to give you the idea that they are successful in causing many to follow their injurious ways, their destructive ways. Actually, their pernicious is murderous ways. These are men who pretend to be true followers of Jesus Christ. They are religious men who end up, as 2 Peter 2 and 13 says, that are spots, blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. They pretend to be true believers, religious people who participate in church affairs. In the book of Jude, verse 12, he called them spots in your feast of charities, who when they feed themselves with you, they feed themselves without fear or fearlessly. They're not bothered to go in and try to take advantage. They are like greedy dogs who can never have enough. That's what Isaiah called them. Imagine that. Greedy dogs who can never have enough. There is no fear before their eyes. They despise anyone who tries to be over them. They do not like to have dominion upon them. They are self-willed and self-pleasing. And they defile the flesh. Jude and verse 8 says, Likewise also, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh. They despise dominion. They don't want to have anybody ruling over them. And they speak evil of dignitaries. We could go on and look as what all of these words use to give us a picture of their character, their stains. They are disfiguring spots to the local churches. You know how it is when we get older, we get age spots. Other things creep up we never had before. Um, but praise the Lord that the Lord said that one day in the book of Ephesians, I believe it is, he says he will present us not having spot or wrinkle. Ah, when we are changed, we will be free from any blemish. But we are not to wait for that change. We as a church are to be active in recognizing that there are in these latter days going to be characters that are going to do damage to us. And we ought to be busy removing them from our midst or pointing them out that others will not follow after. These false prophets, these false teachers, these scoffers literally live to indulge the flesh. They seek to remove dominion over them. They don't want to be under a church authority or anyone else for that matter. They want to give themselves freedom to follow after the lust of the flesh. Well, it's interesting that the largest part of this particular epistle is chapter 2. And you know that the chapters and verses and so on are man-made, but nonetheless, it helps us to see and organize and tell you where we're going, where we're at as far as identifying, but the largest part of this is all that chapter two. And it's all about the uh, wicked people and the wicked characters and their wicked devices. The desire of the enemy, of course, is to shake and unsettle the faith of the believer. Satan uses these ungodly, unjust, brute beasts to bring in damnable heresies and bring about swift destruction they do this peter says under a disguise who privily privately i think it's privily bring in damnable heresies in other words that's they they disguise them when they bring them in and they do it for the purpose of enriching themselves peter's using a metaphor uh, when he uses the verse that they will make merchandise of you I think we see it here. He says, when they bring privately or privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. But it's the idea that these things 
deny them, but you go again, verse 3. Oops, let me get that in there. Verse 3. And through covetousness, what are they going to do? Shall they with feigned words, fake words, molded words, words purposely set forth in order to fake you out, that they might become rich by you, that they might make merchandise of you. The whole passage is the idea that they're trying to take advantage of the believer. It, it's the same way, folks, you realize there is an industry out there that takes advantage of the elderly in our communities. They do it purposely with feigned words. And, and this is applied to religious matters, to church affairs. In the first epistle, when Peter wrote it, he had warned the elders or the pastors to feed the flock not for filthy lucre. The church has to be aware of the, the, possible, the possible intrusion of false prophets and false teachers. It is a reality every church must consider. Peter warned these men, you, your motive's got to be right. You take and feed this flock, taking the oversight among you, but don't do it by constraint, but willingly. In other words, the Spirit of God has to have moved upon that church and you equally to bring you together. And it ought never to be for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Peter also gives us some amount of encouragement, though, by noting that these characters are not going to enjoy their profiteering for long. It says, their damnation slumbereth not. Divine judgment is certain, and there is a certainty of biblical examples given throughout the scriptures. The examples that Peter uses are the fallen angels, the world that was destroyed by the flood, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and of uh, Balaam. He, like the apostle Paul, made sure when, like when it's the same wording that the apostle Paul uses, where he says in verse 18 of chapter one, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in righteousness. That's just what Peter was saying when he was talking about the fallen angels He's talking about the flood, and he talks about the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and about Balaam. You're not going to get away with it. There's judgment coming. The teaching of these two great apostles are consistent with one another and throughout the word of God. Paul told the church at Rome that these men who act like that, just like Peter, they're not serving God. But like Peter, what does he say in 16 and 18? He says, they serve their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. It's the same message that Peter is preaching. They entrap. And, and they absolutely do. Look at 2 Peter 2 and 18 and what he says. For when they speak these great swelling words, it's almost like you're reading Paul here too, of vanity, they allure or they entrap through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that have that were clean escaped, people who got out of those fake religions or a religion that required uh, giving and it was always a works oriented. They've a clean escaped, but now they're entrapped again. They seek to entrap you and ensnare you right back into that which you've been caught. It's the same thing that uh, Paul was telling the churches of Galatia. Who hath bewitched you? Sadly, there are those who will follow their deadly and dangerous ways. We need to heed the words of the apostle Peter. We are living in those days and these spots and blemishes may be among us. These men, and you can watch them, you can see them. These men promise liberty from, excuse me, from poverty. The Bible doesn't do any such thing. They promise liberty from sorrow. 
And yet the Bible tells us that these sorrows, we're not going to be liberated from them. Not now, not during this earth time. They promise liberty from the corruption of our nature. <laughs> no, you're not. Not until that mortality and that corruption goes into the grave will you be raised up immortal and incorrupt. They promise liberty from the mechanical chains of religion, and yet they are entangled by the same and overcome by the very things that they promise liberty from. They are not free from their old nature, nor is any man. We must struggle, but they don't even do that. They are going to be like the pig or the dog. The dog, it says, will return to its own vomit. And the pig or the sow, no matter how clean you try to make them, they will return not just to the mire, but they will return to the enjoyment of wallowing in the mire. These false characters that we've been talking about put on a show of cleanliness, but they are not clean. But brethren, you have been made clean. Now there's plenty of more to look at in this whole chapter, or the, all three chapters here, but that ought to help us get a little bit further along in our study. And I want to remind you that in our next lesson, we will spend some time on the contents, maybe a couple of different uh, lessons just on the content. That doesn't mean that we'll stop, but it just means we're trying to keep these lessons down to about or under 30 minutes, give you time to be able to soak it in and not have to uh, give all your time up in the study. Um, but we do want to encourage you and we do want to impress you about the study of God's word, how to study it by showing you through a study of God's word. And I hope and pray that you have been blessed. Let us know if this has been encouraging to you. Uh, we would appreciate a comment, uh, an email. You can send it to our church, uh, go to our church uh, website and our addresses are there. Lord bless you. Enjoy your study of God's word.